I think that's really something you have to do with all good fiction. I mean, even a, in a thousand page book, you're never going to know the totality of your protagonist. My name is Ben Charland, and you are listening to What on Earth is Going On. My guest this week is Barbara Bell, Artistic Director of the Kingston Writers Fest. And Barbara and I tackle a book called Duck's Newburyport by Lucy Ellman. This book was published in 2019 when it won the Goldsmiths Prize. It was also shortlisted for the 2019 Booker Prize. It is a thousand pages long, consisting pretty much of one single sentence. The book is a block of text, except where it is punctuated by a parallel story about a mountain lioness. A fascinating piece of literature, and it is much more readable than that block of text makes it sound. Now, Barbara and I talk about a lot of things when we dig into this book. Massive chaos and uncertainty on which this book seems to be commenting. Memory, environmental problems, gun control, gun violence, consumerism, technology, the blind spots of American history, the power of repetition, and the fellowship of women, as well as the idea that women have been negated from history. The book is also about repression, about what is not being said, a fascinating idea for a piece that is a thousand pages of block text, and yet What is not being said? Sometimes it's obvious, and sometimes it is not so obvious. In fact, there's one thing that Barbara reveals that I had no idea was being hidden from me when I read this book. Now, if you like this conversation, please give this podcast a review and a rating on Apple Podcasts or whatever podcast provider that you use. You can also go to the website, whatonearthisgoingon.ca, and there you can find all previous episodes and a way to get in touch with me. Let me know what you think of this episode about any others and let me know what you think we should do in future episodes, who you think we should be talking to. I really look forward to hearing from you. Barbara Bell, welcome to the program. Thank you for having me, Ben. Thank you for being on to talk with me about this massive, gargantuan, thousand-page book, Duck's Newburyport. Um, I'm really excited to talk about this book, uh, and this is something that you suggested that we tackle a few months ago, um, and when you suggested it, I just said yes. You just said, hey, let's do Duck's Newburyport, and I hadn't heard of it, and I just said, sure, and I think you said in your email, it's really long, and I thought, ah, oh, we got lots of time, and I had just enough time to get through it. It was, uh, it, I, 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 it was difficult. It was taxing. Yeah. But it was also spellbinding and very worth the read for me. I really enjoyed it. Um, yeah. How about you? And that's what the reviews were saying. Before, And like you, I didn't know a lot about a book. And I, I'm actually fine with that. I'm not a big reader of synopses normally. Um, I just knew that it was very well regarded. The reviews that it had been getting were just stellar. And of course, it was shortlisted for the booker and whether you believe in the validity of jurors weighing in on you know weighing the merits of books or not and lucy elman was actually critical that year because they chose two books and she thought that that was Uh, yeah disgusting because one of them was a black woman and she said the first time they have a black woman win she get they give her half the dough yeah. Yeah. Uh, and also, actually, her publisher, her Scottish publisher, on her behalf, felt that the other, um, the other contenders could not have been um, weighed up properly, given that they gave the prize to two people. Right. Um, uh, I'm sure she's happy just with things the way they are, and I actually applaud her concern for the first woman of color, person of color. Has there been a person of color win it before? Probably. Well, there have been males, but not Right, not females. females. Yeah, and that was her mm-hmm. point. Um, and interestingly, her, pub- her normal publisher, Bloomsbury, turned this book down. Mm-hmm. And it had to be published by somebody else because they thought, well, for obvious reasons, that it l- seems impenetrable and too long. But I don't find that at all. I, I'm never intimidated by a doorstopper. And that's probably how I described it to you um, when yeah. I suggested it. Um I think you can you get you get depth if it's well written. The, you still get to the end of the book thinking, "Oh, I wish there was more." I mm-hmm. mean, in a really well written book, a thousand pages it doesn't it doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. 
um, you stay with it. Barbara, I wanted to give you the big question to start us off, um, which is normally what on earth is going on. But when we talk about a book, I want to find out. In other words, we're inquiring this book and this author that question. And you and I are almost the hosts of this, and this book becomes the guests. So according to Duck's Newbery Report by Lucy Elman, what on earth is going on? Um, what on earth is going on is um, massive chaos and uncertainty, global massive chaos and uncertainty. And how are we as individuals to cope with that? Hmm. That's what's going on. How does the narrator, the unnamed narrator, cope with it in this book? She doesn't cope very well. Um, it's funny. She she says numerous times that she has no. She has a terrible memory. She has the worst memory of anyone in the world. <laughs> Which she is never absurd. remembers anything. And this is a constant stream of everything uh, of, she remembers. Yeah, yeah, and I mean, she has a really um, rich general knowledge. So her knowledge of old movies, her knowledge of literature, her knowledge of music, her and knowledge of, of uh, the culinary arts uh, is, yeah. And I mean, <laughs> you know, this is peppered throughout with, it's all random. It's all very random, exactly the way our mind works, which is, a, to me, a phenomenal feat in itself to have replicated so accurately that never-ending voice, doesn't matter what we're engaged in, there's this constant narrative going on. Well, and so this book is written in a stream of consciousness, consciousness style. It's one sentence over a thousand pages punctuated by a very traditional, concise story of a mountain lion, a female mountain lion, um, which is which kind of goes in and out of that. The, the two things do overlap a little bit, interestingly. Um, but when we talk about stream of consciousness writing, there's a lot of it out there and it's not always successful. Sometimes it feels, oh yeah, this is just like I think, but it's not enjoyable to read. It's not entertaining. It's not a page turner. It doesn't grip me like this book gripped me. Mm -hmm. So how does she do it? I mean, is it, I don't know if it's content or if it's the technique, but she seems to have struck something over such a long book, um, making stream of consciousness interesting to the reader. And I just wonder if you mm -hmm. have a... a a thought as to how the, how she's done that. Well, that's skill. <laughs> you know, that is real writerly skill, the fact that she could pull this off. And it is readable. It's actually quite painless to read. Yeah. Um, and, and it just flows along. It flows along and it flows along and it flows along. I mean, it's incredibly dense, just incredibly dense. And uh, you think you're just reading along at a good clip, but you realize, you know, in an hour you've done maybe eight pages yeah. because there's no, there are no white spaces, there's no breaks, uh, there's no punctuation of any sort to, you know, let you jump ahead. Because right. in most books, well, there's all the indentations for dialogue and then there's, you know, these nice little white spaces at the beginnings of ends of chapters. But no, this is solid book, solid. How does she do it? Wow. Um, if I knew the secret to that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I just think it's a tour de force, honestly. Yeah, when I was reading it, um, not only did I feel like, wow, this is hard because where do I take a break? And where do I put my bookmark to remind myself of exactly where I was so I don't lose my spot? Because you could easily lose your spot in this book and never mm -hmm. find it again. But also, in a single page, so much happens. Now, that's not a plot thing. No. There's not necessarily a lot but that's happening in plot. A lot of topics get covered right. in, on one page. A lot of thoughts. And my mind goes in so many different places that I feel like a half an hour has passed and I've read one page. Yeah. I've gone through the thoughts of one page. But what I, what happened to me in reading this was... I was, um, how would I say, um, spellbound or mesmerized by being inserted into someone else's consciousness, consciousness, um, by p being in their shoes for a little while, really. And I, it's not like um, we often empathize with a character in a film or in a novel, typically, um, where we kind of, oh, I understand where they're coming from, and I understand how they think, and I feel like I get this character. It wasn't about getting this character. It was about being in her mind mm -hmm. in a very real and visceral way, which was troubling at times, but, but immensely entertaining. There wasn't a single sentence or, or section or sequence where I felt like, I was not getting it. Yeah. There was nothing that was unclear to me. Um, there were a lot of references. I'm like, I've never seen that movie before, The Odd Couple or The Apartment. I've never, I've never seen these films, but it doesn't matter. 
I was still able to relate to what she was talking about because in a way she didn't have to see them either. They were almost secondary to what she was talking mm-hmm. about. Because she might be talking about an attribute of a character in a movie and why he says that. Or, oh no, maybe that wasn't that movie that he right. was in. Maybe it was that other movie that he was right. in. And that is just how our minds work, isn't I like it? Harrison Ford. Was it Air Force One or The Fugitive? Yeah. And she would, it was just so interesting how she did this. And by doing it, it reminded me of how I think and how I remember. And you're right. This idea that she thinks that she has a bad memory is absurd. Yes. And one of the achievements for me of this book is actually to show that this is one person's mind. Now, I think it's debatable about the the time period of this book. I don't think some, I read a review that said it was only a single day. Uh, and I don't think that's no, true. No, that person didn't read the book. I agree, because I was going... Th- that's their, They were probably thinking of Mrs. Dalloway, written by Virginia yes, Woolf. Yes, and that takes place that in a That takes day. place in a single day. And actually, Lucy Ellman said that too. she'd never read it. She <laughs> hadn't read it before writing that's this book. That's awesome. <laughs> and, uh, but but I, in the first 100 or 200 pages, I was thinking, okay, what's the time period here? Because that's important for understanding how rapid these thoughts are coming through. Mm-hmm. Is this a page per second? a page per hour or what is it? Mm-hmm. And I don't, th- I don't think there's necessarily a mathematical code to it, but there is evidence in the book that it takes place maybe over a couple of months because she's remembering things that were once present for her. Yeah. And then it's, she was remembering it as if it were some time ago. Um, but what it does to me is it shows this is a single person's consciousness in a slice of time. And if you take all of this together, the immense amount of material, it is a testament to a human being and how much they have going on. Oh, yeah. It, and it's interesting because it is actually firmly placed in a place and a time mm-hmm. um, in history. In Ohio, I guess, yeah. 2017. Yes. Yeah. So it's just so culturally relevant, still very relevant to um, in 2019, incredibly relevant. Sure. So, yeah. And, and I think that's exactly how our lives unfold. We don't think necessarily about... Uh, this is my time and this is my place and I'm, you know, uh, but we are just so imbued with um, everything that's going on around us and, and it infiltrates all of our thoughts, whether it's in the forefront of our mind or not. Mm-hmm. We're thinking about these big things that are going down and, you know, in 2017, as in today, there are very big things going down and she's, she's thinking about them. I mean, she raises pretty much every sort of social and societal issue there is today and anxiety she's yes. anxious the, and, about oh yeah i mean yeah. and and she she references very clearly the cultural anxiety certainly of of uh, of the united states but of north america and of, of kind of the developed world and presumably the undeveloped world too when she's uh, and she she has a teenage daughter and she's completely clear that this child is carrying a great deal of anxiety mm-hmm. she reflects upon how hard it must be for American high school kids to go to high school. Um, they don't feel safe. Um, they, they worry about environmental problems. They worry about gun control and being gunned down. I mean, she reflects on those things a lot. Um, just the thoughts that I think most ordinary Americans are having of, am I safe here? What's going to happen? Is some guy going to come in and, and just open up, open fire? Yeah, the and, open carry uh, op- repetition in the book. Yeah. Uh-huh. And and all those little headlines that inject themselves in saying, you know, um, husband kills wife, four children, and then uh, self right. in a uh, bloody rampage. You know, there are always, there are always yeah. tabloid headlines and, that, that she injects in and, there. And the massacre, I don't know actually to say this, at Naden Hutton or something, which is close to where the character is based in Ohio. Mm-hmm. There was a massacre of indigenous people close by that she refers to time and time and time again, mm-hmm. which I think forces us as the reader to remember, oh, this isn't just about her. This is about the United States. It's this a is about huge criticism. Yes, of of the mentality that has uh, been the basis upon which America has developed its own self understanding and the blind spots that it willingly has of its history. Absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And what's what's uh, unacceptable coming from um, a non American is suddenly acceptable. I mean, she she's pretty clear. Um, you know, she slams uh, the the heroes of history who were praised for, for instance, right. you know, being responsible for this massacre. There's more than one um, massacre of indigenous peoples that sure. she references that took place on what is now American soil. She's very clear mm-hmm. um, that, you know, settler 
um, incursions into what was territory owned by and lived upon by indigenous peoples for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. But it's interesting because it doesn't, this is not overtly a critique. Right. It's, uh, it's quite overtly um, an interrogation of what happens in a human being's mind when when life is complex the way it is right now. Well, in a really um, authentic way, it's asking the question, what would it be like for a, a baking a, a woman who stays at home baking all day to live in Ohio in the year 2017, just making her life go with all of the things that she has in her past, all of the things that she may have in her future? How does life work for her? And what does she think about? And it, it, you don't have to make a political critique to admit that she has to be thinking about things that are awful. Mm -hmm. And she has to be thinking about and implying that the culture in which she lives has corollaries as blind spots to the ones that she has. Yeah. She doesn't remember or says she doesn't remember her past. Well, her country doesn't or chooses not to remember things in its past. But there's something interesting going on here too that I found relevant, which is that the way in which she talks and thinks and receives information in the world is different from, say, someone 50 years before. Because mm -hmm. it's clear that sometimes she's looking at her phone. It's mm -hmm. clear sometimes that the narrator is looking at an article, a headline, uh, scrolling on her phone, or she's writing down a list of groceries, or that she is watching a movie as she's making cinnamon buns in her kitchen. And that these things are coming at her from all these different directions. And that she's overwhelmed by all of this information, as we all are. And there's mm -hmm. actually a line in the book um, page 323, where, she's, uh, where the narrator says, there's maybe too much emphasis on facts these days, or maybe there are just too many facts. <laughs> and it's, I didn't realize this until I got to the end of the book, that the book is in a way, and this is where the mountain lion story comes in, in a way showing us where I thought it was a testament to how grand the human mind is, how much we can encapsulate in just a few months, or if it is a single day, for example, how much we think about, how much we grab onto, grapple onto, how much we consider, how much we remember. But in the end, I realized it's too much. The mountain lion is very simple. The story of the mountain lion, I think, and I'm assuming, takes place over the exact same period of time. But she chooses not to remember all of this crap. She's not burdened by all of the pressures of the facts of daily life. Mm -hmm. And she has a single mission of being a mother, a very similar mission to the narrator in the book. So in a way, the, the, it's, it's, I guess, And James, she's responding to her environment. Right. Right. With the sole purpose of keeping her cubs safe. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Which is what the narrator in the book really wants right. to do is to nurture and take care of her children. But misses that in the fog of all of this craziness that's mm -hmm. going on around her. And that juxtaposition between the two is really interesting. And mm -hmm. in a way, it's like a James Joyce book where the reading of it is the message that it's delivering. The medium is the message. Yeah, yeah which absolutely. Is interesting because Lucy Elman's father was a James Joyce scholar. Uh, Richard Elman. Yeah, she's no slouch. There's, mm -hmm. And like her narrator, her parents were educated. Uh, they were teachers. And, um, you know, I'm never going to say this is autobiographical. It's way too good for that. It's way too good to be autobiographical because I, I, I think there'd be pitfalls in this right. if it was autobiographical. But there's a thing I thought it had to be. When I was reading it, I didn't look her up. I didn't read anything about the book until I was finished. And I thought, this has to be real. This has to be a woman talking about what it's like to bake in her kitchen. Because <laughs> I couldn't imagine an author imagining so well what it's like to be in that position. She doesn't even live in Ohio. She lives in Scotland. Yeah. <laughs> I, was, I was blown away when I read that after the book. Yeah. Yeah. She, um, she's done her research well. And she, I think she understands human nature to a just a quite astonishing degree. Uh, you know, we were talking about memory and thinking and that kind of thing. And, and she actually, there are a couple of passages where she's thinking about, um, first of all, what other people think about, but also maybe what animals have in their heads and uh, eagles. And, you know, she's thinking about them and uh, how alert they are all the time. They and must present. be thinking tremendous, yeah. you know. And then she says something that about... I'll st I'll stop thinking when I'm dead. It's something yes. like that. The, what this, was that? The, the, it's like the stream of consciousness will will this finish. This monologue. When I'm dead. Yeah, she yeah. says. I just realized that when this monologue in my head finally stops, I'll be dead, or at least totally unconscious, like a vegetable or something. 
the fact that there are seven and a half billion people in the world, so there must be seven and a half billion of these internal monologues going on. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and and uh, you know, it's a kind of a privilege to enter into this internal monologue because it's just so rich. What do you think of that phrase, the fact that? Oh, it was a great tool. I thought it was a great bridger. Um, otherwise, there would have been a kind of feeling of disjointedness almost and mm-hmm. because our minds, it, and of course, even in the course of uh, one single example of the fact that, which is what she uses sort of to preface each new thought, when she goes into those long, absolutely delightful, rambling, um, associative lists of words, you know, so she starts with one word and then something that rhymes with it, and then she the permutations and ends up in a completely different place. And there may be 40 or 50 words in one single set of those. Yeah. It was, it's quite brilliant. And if you're a lover of words the way I am, it was just fun to read that and watch. And, you know, that is how my mind works too. How I'll think of, I enjoy words and I'll think, isn't that a funny word? You know, think right. about it to myself and right. that kind of thing. It's propulsive. Yeah. Uh, you know, it was it was so interesting to me that uh, I didn't know what to expect. So I started reading that and I thought, okay, so maybe she changes that because every sen- every thought is prefaced by the fact that. Mm-hmm. And so after about 20 pages, I thought, okay, so maybe halfway through she'll start saying, and considering that, and considering that, <laughs> or something. Yeah. And she doesn't until the very end. It's one single sentence. Yeah, so it's a really consistent mechanism and signals to us, oh, this is progr- This is forward motion. Right. But what's powerful about that phrase for me is that it both sometimes made it a um, sort of a peripatetic, um, oh my God, what am I tumbling into sense in reading it, but sometimes it also felt calming, like making a list. Mm-hmm. Um and just going slowly down this list, like Umberto Eco once said that a list is a, is, a, is humanity's way of getting in touch with infinity, that we make a list almost to be infinite, to get close to that, although we'll never get there. I love um, Umberto Eco. And there's a, lo- a sense in this, well, there's a lot of lists that she goes, oh, almost, yes. the entire book in a way is a list mm-hmm. of all of her thoughts in mm-hmm. chronological order. Some of them repeat though. <laughs> uh, well, and that actually, the repetition of a thought is a signal to me of what's important. Mm-hmm. Um, without an author massaging it and highlighting it. Either the, either what's important or what kind of vexes her the most. So when we have repetitive thoughts, they're not always comfortable. We There are certain things we just can't forget and we keep revisiting them. And it, I think it's a real um, signal about her discomfort, right. her mental, her psychological discomfort with what is. And so that's why you do see words and phrases and the fact that's repeating themselves. She talks over and over and over about how her, how mommy's illness broke her. How many times does she say that? You know, that was obviously a seminal um, crisis in her life and she can't let it go. She's aware of that too. But still, she can't let it go, and it just keeps emerging. You know, when mommy got sick, when mom, you know, mommy couldn't take me outside to eat peaches and cream in the sunshine anymore, mm-hmm. and, and all I, of those things. And I watched her turn to mush uh, when she got sick. It was, was one of the lines in mm-hmm. the book, which is so related to baking, yeah. so related to trying to do the opposite, a, a to failure, turn, <laughs> to turn mush into something mm-hmm. hard and 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 edible, substantive, to yeah. kind of reverse the process of her mother's de- decay and decline. Um, and also the title of the book, Doc's Newburyport, is descripting, describing her mother's death. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's actually, I read this, it was so interesting, I would never have figured this out without reading it in some article or something after reading the book, that it's actually an echo of Nabokov's Lolita. When, when, when in that book, uh, what is it, H- Herbert Humphreys or something like that, the guy's name? H.H., um, the main character. Yeah. And H.H., the main H-H, character yeah, in yeah. Lolita. Um, the narrator in Lolita describes his mother's death by saying, picnic lightning, right? That's uh-huh. how his mother died. Um, oh, and sorry, it's and, and in, in Duck's Newburyport, Duck's Newburyport is a description of her mother's near death, not her death, but her right. near death when she was only two years old. And if she hadn't died or she had died there, this character would not be alive today. Yeah. Um, and I thought... There, there, are, there must be so many other references in here because Lucy Ellman is such an educated author mm-hmm. that went right over my head, but it didn't make it at any point, like some books do when they're so referential or intertextual, uh, 
an impenetrable book to read. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting because sometimes she's clear in her referencing of classical works or, or, you know, the canon, the literature canon. But as you say, sometimes it's just embedded in there. She's, she's erudite. It's, it's quite, quite phenomenal. Something that Barbara raised so far in this conversation that has stuck with me is this question of writerly skill, the ability of the author to transport you into another world, to speak poetically about the feelings and the ideas that they're communicating, and to do it in a way that makes you read a thousand pages. Now, coming up in this conversation, we talk about the disconnect between agency and anxiety, the fact that this main character in this story seems to have no agency, and yet is responsible, seemingly, for all of the problems in our world. That's coming up on this episode of What on Earth is Going On. What do you make of the narrator's relationship with her daughter, Stacy? Hmm, yeah, it's complex. I thought that was a central thing happening in this book. And you parallel then, you know, her relationship with mommy as a daughter and her own relationship with with her daughter Stacy right. you know, who's so angry with her well you know in some ways Stacy sounds like a typical teenager yeah but she she doesn't really know how to manage that at all cuz i think she i think her mom had a she her mother was very respectful of her as a person and she maybe didn't have to go through didn't have to assert her independence or her individuality in the same way Stacy is doing you know against you know, in sort of in juxtaposition or uh, to her mom's personality. Mm-hmm. Her, Stacey's very critical of her, and that's that's not atypical of teenage girls. And the and the author of this book, Lucy Elman, makes it clear the uh, juxtaposition between that and the mountain lion in her cups, mm-hmm. being so clear as to say near the end of the book that Stacy has a weird um, fascination with the mountain lion, wants to go visit it at the zoo. Um, and that was, a, and to me, that's a central, that was a central theme of the book when I put it down thinking, oh, it's, it's about this, this lineage between mother and daughter. I can't escape that lineage because of the way it's repeated, but also the way it, the, the way the other story interweaves with it. Mm-hmm. And of course, reading a couple of interviews with Lucy Elman after reading it, um, she's preoccupied with this idea of how bad the relationships with mothers and daughters are, are today and how, the one thing that she says is that the um, if we devalue motherhood, the patriarchy wins. The, in, in fact, the patriarchy exists on the on the precondition that motherhood is devalued. Hmm. And this is a book about motherhood, and that and that relationships between mothers and daughters, or women in general, is are fractured. Yes. Yeah. And have to be fractured in order for the patriarchy to continue. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> suddenly it's all quite uh, quite obvious, isn't it? Yeah. And, and scary um, mm-hmm. because she's losing. I, I just got the sense yes. in the book that... She's, uh, she's, she's pretty... She's swamped. She's... Maybe literally, like if you go to the story of the ducks in Newburyport, that she's drowning, that she's yeah. drowning in all of this information and all of this mm-hmm. pressure and anxiety. And and uh, also this sort of, this lack of self-confidence. Mm-hmm. And she, you know, she describes over and over again what a failure she is at so many things. She's an extreme introvert from what I can gather, but she has no self-confidence at all. So she thinks she can't throw a cocktail party. She thinks that people don't really like her. Um, you know, she doesn't know how to fit in. She'd rather stay home. Um, she may not be functioning very well. And mm. maybe that's, I wondered why, why are you always baking? And ostensibly it's to help bring a little extra money into the, um, household purse and, uh, prepare for the children's, you know, she's got four kids that she wants them to have an education so she's trying to save money but maybe she's she's sequestering herself in there because she's not really very functional and that may be partly why Stacy's so cross with her in a way Stacy's saying like come on grow up or be be Mm -hmm. present in the world watch more morning routine videos yeah well and (laughs) I mean she's a typical teen she's she's woke for sure like she's vegan she's you know alert to um what how young people today have got to step up environmentally and uh, uh, get the, the grown-ups to do something. 
But on the other hand, she's beholden to the opinions of these, you know, YouTube influencers mm-hmm. that are negative. Right. Which mm-hmm. is so typical of mm-hmm. yeah. the modern predicament of people who are engaged, over engaged, perhaps with social media. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and that may go in some way to explain the the fraught relationship between women, between especially mothers and daughters. Because mm-hmm. there's nothing richer and more empowering than being with, for as a woman, being with another woman and having, you know, that kind of fellowship and um, a fruitful discussion, whatever, support, whatever comes out of actually being in the same room together. I wonder if one way to look at this book is to imagine what would it be like for Stacy to read this book? Hmm. Right, be what an eye be? opener for her. Yeah, like oh my god, I didn't realize my mother was so multidimensional and so. Thoughtful. I didn't realize my mother was struggling. And yeah, you know, like I think right. it might wake up a little empathy, right, uh, in Stacy for her mom. That's one thing about you know when you have a sort of gen- generally stable home and you have two parents and there's bread on the table and all of that kind of stuff. Kids can take their parents for granted and not actually realize that they're people. And perhaps understand with more empathy what's wrong. Well, I don't know. I mean, I was going to say what's wrong with the world, but I'm not going to say that the narrator of this book is what's wrong with the world. Mm, No. But she's the prism through which what is wrong is reflected, and and she's holding the weight of it. Yeah. I mean, this is... As we all do in some ways, right? Right. Like a stay-at-home mom who bakes in Ohio seems to me the foundation of modern America. Mm -hmm. I can't imagine any more foundational single person Mm -hmm. to that country's, you know, soft middle. Mm -hmm. Um, And therefore, if she's bearing the weight of it, that kind of makes sense. Mm -hmm. Um, She doesn't have to read, what is it, Howard Zinn's History of the United States. I can't remember the name of that book. But but this book is essentially doing what Howard Zinn was trying to do, which is to say, look underneath the surface here. There are things that we don't recognize every day when we worship the mythology of this country. Mm -hmm. Um, And, you know... um, and it's so present. Trump is a haunting figure for for the narrator in the book, partly because it's so present for her, mm-hmm. but also because it just kind of sums up a lot of these issues. Yeah. Um, whether it's climate change or um, open carry, the guys that are carrying guns everywhere and, and shooting up schools. I mean, it's all kind of connected. Yeah. In a in an interesting way. Well, and then and in fact, it is connected to the negation of women of their place in history, because if you knew what those stories are throughout history. Those are the stories that need to be inserted right. into the, you know, into the record is uh, where were the women? What were the women doing? How did they feel about this, you know, these things happening? And mm. and w- stories are starting to emerge, like, you know, um, <sighs> trying to identify a woman from the past who who furthered the cause of, of um, women, um, women's rights, w- women's equality, you know, um, they get put on a pedestal and you still don't know who they are. Hmm. I'll be interested. I haven't seen the Harriet Tubman movie, but I'll, um, I'll, a movie, but I'll be interested to see that, to see if she's, um, you know, put on a pedestal in that male model of, right. Uh, you know, the rugged hero. <laughs> <laughs> I and, hope not. And heroic action as opposed yes. to yeah. well, what, the well, quiet actions that yeah. that really are the fabric that holds the nation together. Right. The quiet domestic actions that women do daily. Which is the true sense of what a reformation is as opposed to, say, like a revolution. Mm-hmm. You know, where you are going to change a society without erupting in violence. Yeah, and you start to value those things. And you look at some of the Scandinavian countries where they are actually valuing that that work in the home the raising of children and that kind of thing and actually putting a dollar value on it paying mothers who are staying at home raising children i um yeah i was quite touched by by this book in that sense because it was i mean i'm a guy i'm a, i'm True. a i'm a white guy living in canada i'm i'm privileged but I still felt, and even though I'm not Stacy, I'm not the mom, I'm not, I mean, I, I guess I could be one of the boy kids that she has if I was going to put myself in there, or the husband, with whom she has a very positive relationship. According to her, um, I, okay. I had questions about that. Okay, go I on. And he's remarkably absent. Right. And uh, she's always talking about how his work 
keeps him, takes him away, keeps okay. him away from the home. Right. She also talks about how much he loves her. And that made me wonder. Uh, I'm so lucky. He loves me so much. Leo just loves me. But there are undertones every now and then when she talks about their sex life, and I sort of feel like it's on hold. And to me, that's a recipe for trouble. Right. You know, a husband who is doing work that he enjoys at a remove from the household and that takes him away occasionally. Um, and a woman who's stuck at home isn't, doesn't dress, you know, I mean, Stacy's always down on her for schlepping around in sweats. She, she isn't t- caring for her personal appearance. There, I'm trying and to also she talks about being kind of sexually s- shut down in terms of, oh, we've got so many kids that just never seem, you know, and I always right. conk out when we get into bed. Right. And, this is partly why I'm so glad to talk with you, Barbara, about this book, because this is something I didn't see. Alarm bells are ringing, Ben. <laughs> right. And I, so I did obviously get a lot of the sexual frustration in the book. Every time she approaches, the narrator approaches something sexual, she oh, says, gosh. oh my, oh gosh. Yeah. And she stops herself, which is an interesting repression, which signals other repressions, maybe other things that she's hiding. But mm-hmm. it's just, it's one of the interesting parts about this character, that she's repressing herself and where yeah. she, where her yeah, mind sometimes does want to go. Self-editing kind of, oh, oh, oh how did I even th- ever think of that? Goodness, yeah. you know. Yeah, but when I was reading it about her relationship with Leo, her husband, I was thinking, wow, it's so cool to have um, a couple that seems to be happy and she talks about how much she loves him and how much he loves her and it, and I just, I, I took the surface value of it and accepted it without questioning it like you've done, which makes sense. You're a woman. I mean, I'm, I'm reading it from a guy's perspective and thinking, wow, that's cool. They love each other. And actually, the New York Times in its review said um, that in literature, some, sometimes nothing seems so extraordinary as ordinary happiness referring to that relationship. Now, I don't remember if that's written by a guy or a girl. It'd be interesting to go back and look. It would be uh-huh. because... When I'm thinking about this now, you're right. I mean, it's wouldn't that it seems too perfect. But I guess what I was getting at was I expected it to be a failing relationship. I expected right. a thousand page book about a, a mother living in Ohio with four kids who's baking all day, who has a bit of an absent husband, for that to be a central problem and for him to be a bit of a douche or for them to have a real problem between the two of them or whatever. But for the constant refrain to be the happiness that she expresses was surprising to me, and that's why I accepted it. So is she lying to herself? Is she, and, yeah. You and know, she's repre- uh, is she repressing her, her inner knowledge that things aren't right? And you got signals that she probably is. Mm-hmm. Um, Makes what it else? more interesting, too, because sure. it, 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 if you think about, oh, great, happy marriage, you know, this lovely home, and it, it's very... Um, it's way for thin. There's no depth there mm. at all to that mm. relationship because we don't get anything of their relationship, of their interchanges or anything. I have much more of a sense of who the kids are. Sure. I get a sense of what she thinks of Leo and what she thinks she gets from Leo, but their actual dynamic, their relationship yes. is absent. Yeah, very absent. Yeah. I get more of a sense of the relationship between the mountain lion and... I don't know, her cubs, mm-hmm. I guess, than I do of the two of them now mm-hmm. that I think about it. Yeah, and you think about the richness of what we know about Stacy compared to what do we know about Leo, of his real likes and dislikes. She does say things occasionally, if, you know, he li- in terms of food or something, preferences, or, but, but not a lot. Is this then a book, I mean, I don't want to say that we're going to define what the book is about, but in a way, is this a book about repression, self-censorship, what we're hiding what we're not looking at. Well, that's certainly an element of it. And I think that could live right alongside the hyper awareness that we're all really being subjected to. We'd have, there's nowhere to hide uh, um, from what's going on. Mm -hmm. What on earth is going on? (laughs) (laughs) Well, nowhere to run, nowhere to hide. Even if you try, even if you're like this character who in some ways she is sort of trying, she's, She's not, she she doesn't socialize, she sticks at home, 
she goes into her world of baking, which she she says is, you know, her reptilian brain is doing that work so that her other brain can go. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> because you do get a sense in this book that you're not getting the full picture of her life, obviously. No. There's no way. There's too no. much that must happen. I mean, if in the course of three pages, there's a, there's a flood that occurs in the, in the book. And in the course of that sequence... Um, there's so much more physically happening than she is talking about. In fact, she yeah. expresses very little. It's only later when she's remembering the flood that she talks all about it. Yeah, and when there's actual action, you know, like in the first half of the book, the only actual action is her uh, taking Jake, dropping him off at the playgroup, and taking the pies in the car during a snowstorm to deliver and having a flat tire and then having right. being out on the highway. And saved by Jesus. <laughs> saved by Jesus, but <laughs> you don't even get to... You don't that there's no sort of continuation of the scene right. at the time. It's Until just later. You, yeah, you infer it later on from you know she has a shtick with the kids for quite some time. She keeps saying, "Oh, and I was saved by Jesus." Kids <laughs> didn't think that was all that funny, and then finally you understand yeah. that it was some dude whose name was Jesus who comes along and yeah. uh, takes her to where her tire can get fixed. So that that was the action of the first half of the book, and it and even it was kind of you know. Uh, truncated and um, split apart and stuff. Well, yeah. when that signaled to me pretty quickly that, oh, I'm not getting everything here. Like mm-hmm. I'm, I'm maybe getting as much of the conscious brain as she can give me, mm-hmm. but I'm not getting the reptilian. I'm not getting the action. So I know that even though it's a thousand pages of stream of consciousness that's trying to capture all of her thoughts in list form in a way, mm-hmm. I'm still not capturing the totality, the, the maximum degree of this person, Mm-mm. which... Is a, is a suggestion to me, keep looking. Yes. And maybe look in, in between the lines of what's going on. And I think that's really something you have to do with all good fiction. I mean, even in, in a thousand page book, you're never going to know the totality of your protagonist. There's always going to be reading in the lines. And that's, of course, where um, academic debate can come from because people can have a differing take on what it is they think they've read. Do you think this is a book that is intended for interpretation, reinterpretation, reinterpretation? Or is it a book that flummoxes that and says, no, here I am. Don't try to interpret me. I don't think it was intended for either. I, I don't I don't know if a writer writes with an intent for what people should do with the book. I really firmly believe a writer comes out of a place of a drive to say something. Maybe they don't even always know what it is they're saying. And then it's always going to be open to interpretation. And I think the, this conversation is a testament to the questions that the book proposes. Oh, yeah. And forces us to grapple with urgently. Mm-hmm. Um, there's, a, there's an urgency to the book, even though you could imagine taking a snapshot of her consciousness two years later might be kind of similar. Things might not have really changed. Her relationship is still kind of in the doldrums. And she unluckily has has changed all that much either. Right. She's still baking. Maybe she's got a new client somewhere. Maybe Stacy's going to move out soon or something. But really. Those are the externals. Yeah. You know, I think our personality with all of its foibles and uh, uh, gets developed and we don't really change all that much. And especially... Um, those formative experiences that we have that's, that that's have such an impact on who we are and what what is important to us, but also um, um, what we're afraid of, what we avoid, um, what we regret, what we fear. Um, certainly her childhood experiences uh, have informed who she is and what it is she thinks about over and over and over. So you're the artistic director of Kingston Writers Fest. Is this the kind of book that you'd want to program if you could? Oh, gosh, yes. Why? why? (laughs) Uh, I think uh, Lucy Ellman would be just a treat on stage to have written this rich, complex work. She's got to have a lot of good stuff. And I think put with a good interviewer, it people would be just gaga for it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. She seems to have a great sense of humor, too. A yes. very, very sarcastic sense of humor. Like, in, again, in those interviews that I've read, she'll literally say something like, uh, well, if you could be in charge, Lucy, what would you do? And she first says, well, I don't want to talk about this bullshit of being in charge. And second of all, if I was, yeah, I'd force all the men to give everything, all their money and all their wealth over to the women <laughs> for them to spend how they wish. And of course, you read this in a text interview and you think, wow, that's extreme. <laughs> and then you realize, no, she's, well, yes, yes, it's extreme. And yes, yes she may believe it, but it's also, it's it's fun. It's playful. Yes. It's a bit of a... 
I mean, yeah. I think playful is a good word. And, and I there were numerous times when I just chuckled. I mean, she, she loves playing with words, mm-hmm. but she also has got a quite delicious sense of humor, both Lucy and obviously then the character in the right. book. If, you, if, if we were to imagine this being programmed at Kingston Writers Fest and an hour went by, hopefully more than just an hour because so, there's so much to talk about, what would you hope that people in the audience would leave with? I mean, what questions would they leave with if they hadn't read the book or they had? Um, well, I, I think they'd be leaving with much the same questions that that we've been articulating. You know, um, what does this character have to offer us in terms of um, ways to think about the current chaotic crisis that we find ourselves in as humans? Um, how do I feel about that? Have I what have I what have I learned from this author and this book and character that I didn't know before? That's always a primary thing I'm hoping people will take away is going, "Wow, I never thought about that before," or "I never thought about it in that in way." In that way, yeah. Mm-hmm. Or I never thought how someone else might think about that. Mm-hmm. I never thought about. Like, yeah, I, I think about climate change every day. I think we all do, mm-hmm. whether we deny it or not. I think we all are confronted with this idea. Um, but we think about it in very different ways. Mm-hmm. And to think that, again, uh, a, a baking housewife in Ohio could teach me how to think about it in a new way, mm-hmm. but also show me how someone might really might really be uh, clamped down on by this be be almost submerged underneath this weight mm-hmm. of international well global pressure mm-hmm. um oh is that what's happening to me yeah maybe that's happening to me maybe i'm also suffocating uh even though i don't have a lot to do with her and yeah. fe- and feeling powerless which I, I think she feels powerless and uh, i think that um in terms of ecological disaster which is looming there's this horrendous disconnect between what we understand to be happening and what what agency we have to do anything about it. Right. You know, you you try to affect outcomes by voting in elections. You sign petitions. You try to eliminate plastics from your household. You choose not to shop at Amazon. You, uh, you know stop using plastic bags Mm -hmm. is this having any effect whatsoever and you know am i just as um stressed out as the character in this book and overwhelmed i don't know how much of a connection this character has made to the little life that she is living although she does say sometimes oh you know maybe we should be using solar power but then it costs you have to use plastics and energy to make the solar panels so uh, you know so her little right. mind is just as we all do think we well if I, do. if I make yeah. this choice then that uh, right. there just seems to be no good choices well and that's the exhausting nature of living in the modern world it's mm-hmm. like oh just forget it then i don't have yeah. the energy to yeah. go through this and actually not to make this too philosophical but michel foucault the french philosopher mm-hmm. from the 20th century once said that the the central or one of the central tenets of government is to be exhaustive it can exhaust you it has the power to exhaust you with tax forms mm-hmm. and application mm-hmm. forms and paperwork and getting your license ready for registration the department of redundancy department right and yeah. and to make you just essentially give up yes because yeah. once you've given up then it has the power of being your government yeah because you're no longer confronting it because you just forget it yeah because you've you've already essentially acquiesced the power of bureaucracy yeah because too much energy spent getting nowhere so you're treading water right and i think that it's not just government today that's exhaustive it's the the sort of the corporate elite or Mm -hmm. it's social media it's the kind of the ecosystem that we live in of an overabundance of information that makes us just feel like forget it in terms of privacy for example Mm -hmm. yeah i mean my phone is listening to everything that i say Ah, i just don't want to deal with it (laughs) the amount of steps it takes to not have that it's just well, and you might think it's an impossibility too that we we have no no agency to control the fact that our phone is listening to us or our our laptop. You know, I was thinking about the twentieth century philosophers and the and nihilism and what their experience of post World War One was, where the center did not hold. And I thought, oh, they have no idea. They hmm. thought that was tough. And it's funny because we have everything in, in the Western world, in the developed world. We have everything, and yet we have nothing. It, it's 
I th- wasn't it? I think it was the comedian Louis C.K. who actually said something like, um, we have everything we've ever wanted and everything sucks. <laughs> um, isn't that an interesting irony that we seem to have everything we've looked for, everything we want, it's at, at our fingertips. Or and certainly yet, that, that has been told that we should value. Okay, final thoughts on this book. Why is this book going to be read in 50 years or is it? Are we going to be around in fifty years? <laughs> okay, let's 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 pretend that we let's pretend not only that we're around, but also that we still have the capacity to read books like this, and we haven't. <laughs> you know, it's like what did, what did Winston Churchill say about? Look, I don't know how the Third World War will be fought, but I know the Fourth one will be fought with sticks and stones. Yes. Um, if we're around and have the capacity to read a book like this in fifty years, yeah, well, will we and why will yeah, we? Yeah, is it going to be just? Is it going to be a document of a time and a place? Right, and it certainly is that. But as a piece of literature, I, I just think it does have staying power. It will be like Ulysses mm-hmm. or something like that. It's still read and studied. Mm-hmm. You know, it was of its time as well, and and all kinds of. Um, books from the literary canon that still have something to say to us today. Yeah. That, yeah. that there's so much understanding of of the human um, frailty in this book. It's really powerful. Well, and the other thing too is just as you said that I was thinking that because it takes so long to read, you have to meditate on that question over the time. It's not you're not going to read it in a couple of days, Mm-mm. and so you ha- you're invited to take the time with that with those questions and, you know, think about them through another perspective rather than read a book, think about it, talk about it and move on. Move on. And it actually is a great corrective to the ridiculous pace at which we consume things yeah. nowadays. It's like, no, you're not going to be able to do that with this book. It's kind of like the, the corollary to slow food, the slow food. Oh movement. yeah, definitely. Like the, the whole slow, slow movement. movement, slow reading movement. Huh. I like it. Thank you, Lucy. Cool. <laughs> okay, Barbara, thank you so much. This has been great. My pleasure. To learn more about Duck's Newbury Port by Lucy Elman and about Barbara Bell, Artistic Director of Kingston Writers Festival, go to the website, whatonearthisgoingon.ca. There you can find all previous conversations as well as a way to get in touch with me. Let me know what you think of this episode or any other. And you can also give this podcast a rating and a review on Apple Podcasts or whatever podcast provider that you use. Your quote of the week is from the book, Lucy Elman's Duck's Newbury Port. Here it goes. The fact that we all go on pretending things are fine, hoping everything's A-OK, even though everything is nowhere near OK and we all know it, no matter how many candlelit vigils you hold. Thanks, as always, to our composer, Andrea Wettstein, and special thanks for this episode to Kingston Writers Fest for giving us the space in which to record. Next week, we're talking with fantasy author Guy Gavriel Kay. I'll see you then. (music) 